Well, we have been in a series called Start. Everybody say Start. And we are actually going to end that series this morning, next week. You don't want to miss next week. We have the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God for Jamaica. He's going to be with us, Pastor Michael Grant. If you've never heard him, he is a Jamaica man personality like you just can't even believe. You're, you're going to want to be a part of next week. How many of you would like to go j- to Jamaica? Anybody would like to go to Jamaica? It's the middle of the winter. Well, we can't take you to Jamaica. It's too stinking expensive. So we brought Jamaica to you. That's right. We brought Jamaica to you. If you want to wear your Hawaiian t-shirt, whatever, that's not that doesn't really apply. You can do that. If you want to, you know, put some, you know, locks in it, whatever. You can do whatever you want. But next week is going to be our missions convention. We are providing a free lunch for everybody. You do have to pick up a ticket, though, for it, and those are available in the lobby. We want you to be praying about your missions commitment for this year. And then the week after that, we start a brand new series called White Hot. Pastor Brandon and Ashley are going to share one of the messages. My wife is going to share one, and I'm going to share two in the month of February. It's going to be an incredible series about being on fire for God. There's so much happening here at Inglewood. Make sure you take advantage of all of it. Well, in this series called Start, we've been talking about procrastination. In fact, we've been trying to punch procrastination in the face and really uh, talk about the importance of how we just have a hard time beginning things for the Lord. Uh, we, we're, we're really good at talking about it. We're really bad at beginning. So we started off in week one with our Pray First campaign. I mean, you know, the best way to start is to pray first, to put God right in the center of it all. In week number two, we talked about setting godly goals. And I I think I've had more feedback from that message than any message in the last six months. God has got so many things in the hearts of his people. I've had at least a dozen people come up to me and tell me about their goals and dreams for the Lord. Uh, If you didn't get to hear that one or if you just maybe skipped over it, you need to go to the website. God has great things for you to do. And then last week, wow, what an incredible moment for Jeannie and I. I said it on the video when I introduced my son who spoke last week, uh, Pastor Jordan, um, It's pretty amazing, uh, not just that my faith has gone multi-generational, but that my ministry has gone multi-generational. I am the first Christian in my family, and now my kids are serving God. I have a son that preached an anointed word last week. Man, if you missed out, you need to get to it if the snow kept you home or whatever. Jordan talked about start and start again. Uh, I know I'm a little biased, but I think it was the best message of the series so far. What a powerful word about how that we continue, we can begin. How many of you already canceled that gym membership? That's, how, that's why they make you sign a contract, by the way. <laughs> I think I still owe Bally some money. I'm not sure. Uh, well, today we're going to take one final angle. Uh, we're going to take one last shot at Nehemiah's story. We've been couching this in the book of Nehemiah and the importance of getting started. Today's topic is this. Time is your opportunity. Everybody say this with me. Time is my opportunity. That's right. Time is your opportunity. Physicists actually say that time is the fourth dimension, that it exists outside of our space. Now, if this is true, then it makes time a little bit tricky for us human beings because we live in a three-dimensional world, and physicists tell us that time is really outside of this three-dimensional world. We experience time one moment at, at a time. We call it the present. You know, that's, that's really the only way we can experience time. We're just living right now in the moment, and that's kind of the best we can do. So we really can't grasp onto time. Comprehending the fullness of time and all of its fourth dimension ramifications, man, it is beyond the human uh, uh, ability for us to be able to do that. It is beyond our mental capacity. So if today's topic is true and time is our opportunity and yet time is so difficult to understand, well, we need to take a qu- quick look at this. We need to see what the Bible says about time. And it just so happens that the Bible has a lot to say about time. The problem with it is this. The Bible says a ton about time, but most of the verses where the Bible deals with time and its incredible ramifications in our lives are actually veiled in the language of the Bible. You uh, may be new to the Bible, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I am a I'm a really good thief, so I steal for those from those that are Greek scholars, and I wish I had taken more Greek in college, but I didn't, so um, Greek is still Greek to me, I can promise you that, but I study a lot, and I, and I study those that are really smart in this arena, and the Greeks, well, well, that's the original language of the New Testament, they were trapped in the same three-dimensional world as we are. 
but they had a unique advantage, and that is that they have a language that is much more expressive, has many more dimensions than the English language. You probably have heard preachers say that there are actually four Greek words for love, and, 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 and you'll find this all, 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 a lot of times in Scripture, that if there's a word that's important to us in the English language, you'll find that in the Greek language it has multiple words, it has multiple meanings. And in this particular subject, the subject of time, everybody say time, there are actually, well, there's actually several Greek words for time, but the two that the Bible uses over and over again are this, and we're going to say them together. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing them right. Chronos, or we say chronos, and kairos. Chronos and kairos. Now, now, chronos appears 54 times in the New Testament, and kairos appears around 81 times in the New Testament. They are the two primary words that the Bible uses in the original language to help us to understand time, and they are completely different from one another. See, chronos is this. It is chronological time. It is the ticking of the clock. It refers to minutes and seconds and hours and months and years. And it is, it is the measure of time. And the Bible doesn't avoid this. Chronos is not a bad thing. How I many you know chronos just is, right? It is just the way it is. Time is going to click whether you like it or not. Uh, you can be rich. Well, you don't get any more time than those that are poor, right? That's just the way it goes. Time is chronos. It is chronological. It is a measurable resource. And in fact, the Bible doesn't avoid this. Chronos, like I said, it's not a bad thing. The Bible actually tells us that we are to measure time. Now, two weeks ago, I read this verse to you, Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, which says, teach us to number our days. In the New Living Bible, it says it like this, teach us to realize the brevity of life. Why? That we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, I've got bad news for you this morning. I've got good news that we serve a graceful God, but I've got bad news in that you are running out of time. <laughs> all of us, in fact, Job chapter uh, 15 tells us that uh, all of us are given a certain number of days and none of us can add to the number of our days. So we have a God that can redeem the time. We have a God that is graceful, but it doesn't mean that you are going to get more hours, more minutes. Chronos is a reality. And the Bible tells us if we understand chronos, if we understand chronological time, that we will have a heart of wisdom. You don't have forever to live out your dreams. So we got to get started. Amen. We got to get busy. Now, that second word for time is kairos. Everybody say kairos. Kairos is this. It is, it is opportune time. It means an appointed time, a seized opportunity, a due season, a God moment, we would call it. Kairos happens when this. Kairos happens when God shows up in the middle of our chronos. How many of you think that's a powerful thought? See, kairos is when God decides, like, like Jesus did when he died on the cross, with time and who, to when God decides to step down in the middle of the clicking of your clock, in the middle of your chronos, and he divides it. He says, no, this isn't going to be an ordinary moment. This is going to be a God moment. This is going to be a seized opportunity. It's going to be an appointed time, a due season. This moment, this chronos is going to be kairos. Kairos is, when, is what happens when you let Jesus take control of your chronos. When you finally say, all of my time is not my time, it's God's time. I mean, you know, all time is God's time, right? All time is a gift from God. And when you submit your chronos, if you will, when you finally say, listen, I'm not in control of this. This, my friend, is something I lay at the altar of God. And I don't know how many seconds I have. I don't know how many hours I have, how many months, how many years. But I am going to lay it at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to submit it to him. And all of a sudden, your chronos, your chronological time, has the opportunity, the ability to become kairos, to become an opportune time, to become God time. Now, we see this a lot in the scripture. We see it, in fact, over and over again. This is such a big deal to what we're talking about in this series called Start. When God has something for you to do, and we cleared that up in week number one, God has purposes that he planned out before the foundation of the earth for you to do. When his providence invades your plan, there is an opportunity for your chronos, your chronological time, to be transformed into kairos, your opportune time. But you need to get this. See, kairos requires a disruption of 
chronos. If you're just going with the flow of life, if your goal is just to be comfortable and happy and you can't wait to get home to just watch the ball game and try to get kind of just a decent life going, listen, if you're just clicking off the clock, if you're just living in chronological time, then I've got bad news for you. Your opportune time, your kairos time could be wasted because here's why. See, opportunity is something that has to be seized. Everybody say seized. Really, starting is just an acronym for seizing. See, kairos is when you seize something that God has for you right in the middle of your chronos. Now, I want to illustrate this to you. I've asked two guys to come up and help. Where are they at? Where's Scotty and uh, there we go. And Zach, where's Zach attack? All right, everybody give these guys a big hand right here. Now, I have set up a little something for these guys right here. I am going to, just because I feel like it, I am going to call Zach Evil Kronos. How many of you know you can use your Kronos for evil? And I'm even going to give him some dark, girly glasses. Those are my wives, by the way. Uh, and, and, uh, and then Scotty, I'm going to call him, because I like him better than Zach, I'm going to call him uh, Good Kronos. And I'm going to give him some hipster glasses slash uh, stolen IMAX glasses. All right, there we go. And, and, and so Scotty is good Kronos, or hipster good Kronos, and Zach is uh, girly man glasses, evil con Kronos. Okay, <laughs> and, 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 and so they're going to have a little bit of tug of war with Kairos. So go ahead and pick that up. And you can see right here in the middle, this right here, this represents your Kairos, your opportune time. Now what you've got to get is this. Don't start yet. What you've got to get is this, that your, your, your Kronos... Your chronos, really, if you think about it, it is both evil and good. Time is basically, basically, it doesn't have an opinion on the subject. God gives you the gift of time. What you use that time for, it really is up to you. But I want you to understand this. There is always the evil side of time pulling against the good side of time. We might get real spiritual and call this your flesh and this your spirit. But I can tell you, the enemy wants your time just like God wants your time, right? Right? Because the only real resource that we really have to spend on our lives in this earth is time. And so what's happening is always, and let's go ahead and cheer for these guys, there's always a tug of war happening over your time. I, I, I can tell you this, your chronos, <laughs> we kind of figured Zach would win. Uh, <laughs> come on, Scotty. What is happening? I think, I think Scotty might win. What's up with this? That's the youth of today. They just, all right, let's give them up. Let's give them up. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. <laughs> so what is this all about? What is this all about? Well, well, what's happening all the time is your chronos is always battling over your kairos. And I want you to, that's why I did that. I want you to have that picture in your head. That time is not really as neutral as we say that it is. Because why? Because the enemy wants your time, and God, well, God wants your time. See, opportunity is never neutral ground. It is always contested territory. And the Apostle Paul knew this. And many times he addressed it in his writing. We kind of skip over it because we don't understand what word he's using for time. But I want to show you this in a couple places in the Bible. A couple of verses that you probably know. They're familiar verses. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, the word Paul uses for time is kairos, or opportunity. Opportunity. So at the proper opportunity, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. That word uh, for, for time, again, is opportunity. And then, and, and, and the Bible tells us this, that, the latter part of that, says, therefore, as we have opportunity, our kairos, let us do good to all people. Now, we see the battle over your opportunity there in that verse, but it really, really is clear in Ephesians 5.16, a verse I've used many times from this pulpit. It says, make the most of every opportunity. The word there for opportunity is kairos. It is kairos, time, opportune time. Why? Because the days are what? evil. In the King James Bible, it sounds a little cooler. It says, redeem the time or redeem the kairos, the opportunity. This verse fully reveals the battle that we are facing over our kairos. Why? 
Why are we to redeem the time? Why is, that, why, why is Paul even talking about this? Why do we have to make the most of opportunity? Why? Well, he tells us in the latter part of the verse. Why? Because what? Because the days are what? The days are evil. See, what happened was Paul, I believe this, that Paul looked around the world and he saw like we see today that there are a million ways, if not more, to waste your life. He saw that people were letting evil chronos, if you will, win the war of opportunity by replacing their kairos, their opportune time, with sin. So evil is the day that they lived in that most people were living on autopilot, just coasting through their chronos. They're, they're never having a kairos. They're just walking around, carrying their chronos, just constantly clicking off the clock, wasting opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, never seizing their kairos. Paul saw your kairos, your God opportunities, as a battleground. And there's always going to be a tug of war for your kairos. The enemy of your soul wants your time. Wasted moments eventually add up to a wasted life. Now, one of the books that I was reading this week as I was studying for this Sunday is an incredible book. Uh, uh, actually, actually let, me, let, me, let me get to that here in a minute. Let me get to that here in a minute. Uh, one, uh, there, there's a well-known bronze, uh, there's a well-known bronze sculpture of a fictional Greek character is actually actually called Kairos. And you may have, you may have actually seen this before, but uh, a lot of motivational speakers will say, say that opportunity is bald. And it's kind of a weird statement. Well, they get that from this Greek fictional character called Kairos. And, and in fact, you can see it in this next picture. You can see it really, really well. See, this is a picture of a sculpture, a Greek mythical character called Kairos. And you can see that he is bald from behind. If you ever had a chance to go up and look at this bronze sculpture, you would see that on the bottom that there are actually, uh, there's actually a huge epigram. There's this whole bunch of information, and it, and it gives a series of questions that it answers itself. And, 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 and the questions are this, who are you? Well, I am time. I am Kairos, who, uh, who uh, subdues all things. Put that pick back up. Uh, and, and, and why do you stand on your tiptoe? Well, because I am ever running. And why do you have a pair of wings on your feet? Well, because I fly with the wind. And why do you hold a razor in your right hand to a sign of man that I am sharper than any razor's edge? He's talking about opportunity. And why is your hair hung over your face? For him who meets me to take me by the forewalk. I mean, you know, you have to seize opportunity. And the last question is this. And why in heaven's name? Is your head bald? And here's what he says. Because none, of, none whom I have raced by on my winged feet will now, though he wishes it sore, take hold of me from behind. How many know when opportunity passes you by, it passes you by? And you cannot, cannot grab it from behind. So the Bible is clear. We're to redeem the time and make the most of every opportunity. I did this with you a few weeks ago, but I want you to do this. I want you to put your hand on your heart. And if you can, see if you can feel your heartbeat. Let me just make a statement to you. God never gives a heartbeat without giving a purpose. Whenever God gives you a heartbeat, he always attaches a purpose to that heartbeat. And that means you're not just existing. You're not just floating around. Your heartbeat is not chronos. Your heartbeat, if you will, it is kairos. God has an opportunity for you. And if you still have a heartbeat, listen, you're not just clicking off the clock, waiting to die, hoping that you can be comfortable in the meantime. No, no, no. Uh, uh, God has more for you. I, I always like it like this. When I say the word history, I think of it as his story. And, and if I've got a heartbeat, how many of you know he still has more of a story that he is trying to write? So, so I want you to think for a minute, and I'll get to what I was talking about earlier. I want you to think for a second, if you will, about the value of a moment. We struggle with valuing moments because, well, simply there are so many of them. It, it just seems like they are like sand on the seashore. In fact, I think that's why man invented this. That's why we really invented a way. We, we, we took chronos and we put it on our phones and our watches and our pockets. We, we put it on clocks everywhere. Why? Because, well, we needed a way to manage the, it seems like, immeasurable number of moments 
that we all have. So how do we figure out which moments, if you will, which clicking of the clock, which chronos is the big one? Which, what, what, are the God, what are the God moments? What are the kairos moments? What separates them from all the rest? Well, the truth is this. Every moment is packed with potential. And that potential is simply neutral until it is directed. The potential within your moments, they can be used for good or they can be used for evil. Now, I was thinking about it in my own life. The three biggest moments, I think, in my life, in my existence at this point on the planet Earth, and I could, I could keep adding, I could talk about the birth of my children and a number of other things, but I, I, I think the three biggest moments for me are the moment I asked Jesus into my heart, That's when I stopped the madness, if you will, and I invited Kairos into my chronos, amen? I invited Christ right into the the world that I was living in, and it changed everything. That was the biggest moment for me. I think the second biggest moment for me, or, or in order, would be the moment I accepted the call into the ministry, and the third is the moment I asked Jeannie to marry me. These were just ordinary moments, but they were packed with potential. Now, Every moment has that kind of potential, but what you do with that moment decides the effect that it will have on your life. This chronos, the one you're experiencing right now, this moment, this chronos has kairos potential. How many of you would say amen? You, the moment you're living in now, not the one next year, not the one next month, the moment you're living right now, it actually has incredible potential. The only question is, what will you do with it? Now, what I mentioned earlier is during my study for this uh, sermon, I, I was reading a book that I've read several times. I, I actually was one of my favorite books about 10 years ago. I think it was Pastor Brandon that turned, it on, turned, turned me on to it. It's a book written by a guy named Erwin McManus called uh, Seizing Your Divine Moment. I think it's out under a different topic now, but it's an incredible book. You can still find it. And in the book, uh, Pastor McManus points out that the Greek word that, it, that we get the English word uh, atomic from, or our moment from, rather, is the word atomos. Everybody say atomos. Now, now, it's, now, now, this is where we get the word moment from in the English language, but it is also where we get the word atom or atomic from. Now, now, of course, when I think of atom or you think of atom, we probably, in our society, we think about atomic bombs or maybe the opposite of that. I'd say this is the opposite because a bomb is something that destroys something, and, and the opposite of that would be atomic energy. That is something that empowers something. So, so think about it like this. Your moment is atomic. All of your moments are atomic. They all possess atomic energy, if you will. The the only question is, what will you use that power for? Uh, Will you use a moment to destroy something, or will you use your moment to empower something? Now, an atom is the smallest part of an element. They call it, in science, they call it the irreducible unit. In other words, in, in just normal language, you can't get any smaller than this. The smallest thing they can find is an atom. It is the irreducible unit. And yet within that atom, if it is treated right, if it's treated properly, a a process they call fission, an atomic reaction can take place. The smallest thing becomes more powerful than you could ever imagine. Now listen, when you seize your divine moment, how many of you know it has atomic power? Now probably the greatest example of this we have in Scripture is our Savior himself. The Bible says when Jesus was dying on the cross, all of that sacrifice, his entire 33 years of existence on this earth, the perfect Lamb of God, it all funneled down into this drop at the end of the funnel, a divine, atomic, powerful moment where Jesus said, it is finished. And the Bible tells us that when he said that, an atomic, spiritual, kairos-type reaction took place. If you study it out, you'll find that when Jesus said, it is finished, and he gave up his life, that darkness came over the whole land. The sun, the Bible says, stopped shining. The temple curtain, which was two or three feet thick, it it, it looked like it was just torn in two by, by hands. God was separating the Holy of Holies from the most holy place so that even man could go inside into his presence. The Bible says that rocks split in half, earth shook, tombs broke open, corpse raised to life, soldiers were terrified. A spiritual, uh, atomic reaction, if you will, took place. The greatest 
greatest in all of history. Why? Because a life was perfectly submitted to God. Jesus took all of his chronos and he gave it to his father. And what did his father do? He turned it into the most powerful kairos ever. Now listen, the kairos of Christ is still calling out to your chronos. And he'll never stop. Why? Because he sacrificed his life, he wants to use your life. Now, no, 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 listen, listen, listen. Jesus gave up his chronos. The Bible says that at any time he could have called down a legion of angels. One angel in the Old Testament killed a quarter million people. I'm pretty sure that a legion could have taken care of business. Amen? At any time, he could have said, Father, I'm done with this, and the Father would have rescued him off of the cross. But what did he do? He said, no, no, no. This right here, my chronos, it's not mine. And guess what? Your chronos isn't yours. It's a gift from the Father. And whatever the Father says to do with your chronos, you need to do it. Amen? Jesus gave up his chronos. He died on the cross for you. Why? So that you could have his kairos so that your life wouldn't just be the ticking of the clock, so that you wouldn't just be a chronic, logical, existed type person. No, no, you can experience the miracles of God. Amen? What a powerful God we serve. Amen? What a great God that we serve. Jesus won the battle over your chronos and your kairos. The Bible says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only, to, only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he want to steal? He wants to steal your time. He, he wants to take away the opportunities of your life to kill them, to destroy them. But Christ said this, I have come that you might have life and in its abundance. In other words, I've come to invade this, baby. Amen? I have come so that your life isn't just the clicking of the clock, just some existence and some are more comfortable than others. No, no, no. I've come so that your chronos, your boring, mundane existence can finally be kairos. You can have your God moments. Now, I need to bring all of this back to the book of Nehemiah. There's such a time element in his story. And the Bible tells us this, that the people of God, the Israelites, they had rebelled against God for hundreds of years. They were in captivity for 70 years. Just do the math in your head about this. Jordan hit on this last week. They are returning to Jerusalem for 75 to 100 years. So, so, so we've got a minimum of probably around four to 500 years of rebellion and captivity and going back to a city that's been torn down. And, and even after Nehemiah hears about the need of Israel, Jordan pointed this out last week, it's about four months before he actually even has a chance to talk to the king. And, and then there's more time of preparation, takes them 52 days to rebuild the wall. There's all of this stuff going on. Time is, this is a time in the history of Israel where they are a prisoner to their chronos, if you will. They long for kairos. They used to experience it all the time. I mean, they would just be walking along. They're just poor slaves. They're not well trained. And, and God, the God of kairos, the God of miracles, would come down and he would invade their chronos. And they, they could do things that they normally could not do. They long for Kairos to come and break the silence of their suffering, but it seems as if those days have passed. God used to break into their time all the time. Some of you, this is you right here. Now they're just a chronological people. They're not a Kairos people. Some of you, when you were young, you were all Kairos, man. Man, I tell you, Pastor Doug, I'm just going to live the best life ever. And I'm telling you, every time God says to do something, I'm going to do it. And I'm just going to take the city and I'm going to take the world and I'm going to serve God. And then, oh, you got hurt by somebody and you backslid and you failed a few times. And after a while, the enemy, what does he want to do? The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, right? After a while, he just says, you know, you need to give up on all that Cairo stuff and just start living for the clicking of the clock. You know, it'll be better if you got a fancy car. <laughs> it, it, it'd be better, you know, if you got some stuff, you know, some way, you know, you know but still, I mean, don't believe God for great. You know, you know, this is where Israel's at. They used to be a people of Kairos, man. God's going to rescue us. And now they are just a people of Kronos. This is how many of you might feel. Pastor, I've suffered for a long time, and my days, they're mundane, and my faith, Pastor, it's low, and Will there ever be a time when God breaks into my chronos? 
I, I mean, come on, man. I just can't have another year where it just goes by and we barely make it. And See, what happened was Israel had abused their chronos and their kairos so bad that they find themselves in a place where the city, the walls are torn down. Honey, you know, you don't get into that kind of trouble overnight, especially with a graceful God. You didn't gain that 100 pounds in a week. <laughs> you didn't get $50,000 in debt in a day. No, no, you abused your chronos. You kept on, you kept on doing it. You kept on not believing God and instead financing your future instead of giving it to him. And then you find yourself in a place where the walls are torn down and you're no longer even a Kairos person. You're just a Kronos person, just kind of hoping it might get better and I'm going to crawl out of my hole. Can I just tell you, if God chose to rescue Israel, after all they had done to him, then I can promise you that God on this side of the cross wants to rescue you after all you've done to him. Amen? He wants to break into the middle of your chronos and make it kairos one more time. What changed? I mean, why after all of this chronos, if you will, after all this chronological time, did God finally decide to break in in the story of Nehemiah? Well, I want to give you some answers, and, and, and they're not going to be surprising. This is the end of the series, not the beginning of the series. And, and I was tempted to come up with three things you've never heard before. Really, I'll just be honest with you. These are just remakes of stuff I've already done in the series. And here's, here's, here's what I want you to know. Listen. The answers are not always new answers. It, it, you have enough information right now to change your life. Right. Something I like to say and, and is this. You're, you're just one applied scripture from a changed life. You're not one memorized scripture from a changed life. You're not one illustrated scripture from a changed life. You're not one more sermon from a changed life. I mean, you know, you're just one applied scripture from a changed life. Jeannie and I were talking about this with our marriage the other day. We just said, you know, we've got so much information. I mean, we counsel others on how to have a good marriage. If we would just do the things we know, it would just go to the next level and the next level and the next level. I mean, you know, we've got enough information. Amen? See, chronos, our time, becomes kairos, our opportunity, when you intentionally do what you know to do. So, very simple. I think there are three ways that you can turn your chronos into kairos. The first one is this. The first one is you've got to pray during your time. Prayer was the central theme of Nehemiah's story, and all, uh, myself and Jordan, we both hit on this throughout the series. The Bible tells us in Nehemiah 1, verse 3, they said to me, those who survived the exile uh, are back in the province, and they are in trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broke down. The gates have been burned with fire. In other words, Nehemiah hears about this incredible need. Maybe this, for you, would be the moment when you finally lay out all those credit card bills. It'd be the moment when you finally step on the scale and don't close your eyes. You know what I'm saying? Just this is the moment when you find out how bad things really are. You know what I'm saying? And Nehemiah, he finds out about this. And the Bible says when he heard about these things, he sat down, he wept for some days. He mourned, he fasted, and he what? He prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah is just walking along, and we're almost there, in his chronos, which is not nearly as bad as the chronos of everybody else. I mean, everybody else, man, they're suffering, but he is the cupbearer to the king. He's living in the palace, buddy. I mean, yeah, you could die by drinking the poison the king was supposed to have, but, but still, I mean, he's got a pretty comfortable existence. He's just walking along in his chronos when suddenly he hears about something that tears him apart. Now, we see that in this story, he did three things. He mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. Now, I think there are many who would have mourned. I mean, I mean, man, that just makes me feel bad to hear about how all these other people are suffering while I'm hanging out, eating food with the king. I think many probably would have even lost their appetite for a while and said, I can't do this anymore. They would have, quote, fasted. But Nehemiah takes it to a dangerous third level. And a lot of us never go to this level because we're afraid what happens if we do. We're afraid what God might say if we do. Nehemiah takes it to this dangerous third level, and he prays. 
And he doesn't just pray in any ordinary way. We know this is a desperate prayer because he follows the formula of desperation that we see in Scripture over and over again. Now, I'm not much on alliteration like this, but this will help you to remember it. There are actually, uh, there are actually listen, three R's that you'll find over and over again in Scripture uh, 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 when it comes to desperate prayer. And Nehemiah has all three of these. He reminds God of something, he repents of something, and he requests something. Anytime you see somebody desperate for God in Scripture, they remind God of his goodness, they repent of their sins, and then and only then do they ask stuff of God. By the way, if you're desperate, this would be a really good formula for you to follow. Anytime I fail, I always remind God, you're such a good God. <laughs> you're a graceful God. You told me you would forgive me. I mean, you've forgiven me so many other times. I just want to remind you how loving you are. You won't punish me, I hope, you know, that kind of thing. Right, He reminds God. The Bible tells us in verse 6, he says, Lord, the God of heaven, you are a great and awesome God, and you always keep your covenant of love. He tells God in verse 8, he says, remember the instruction you gave Moses. He's reminding God of stuff he said. He said, you told Moses if we return and we obey these commands, even if we are exiled to the farthest horizon, you will bring us back home, and you will make that home your dwelling place. He reminds God that he's a good God. How many think that's a good thing to do? The second thing he does is he repents before God, and I I love the way he does it. He doesn't just say, well, it's all these people. This is historical sin. I mean, I wasn't there, you know. No, no. No, in verse 6, he says it like this. He said, God, I confess my sin and the sins of my father and the sins of my people. He said, if they didn't do it, well, then I'm going to do it. In fact, the verse Lindsay read this morning tells us that as the body of Christ, we are to confess the sins of our nation. You say, I didn't kill all them babies. Yeah, but you live here. You get what I'm saying? It's time that we repent of our sins. So he reminds God he repents. And then look at what he does. He requests something of God. Verse 11, if you can find this in chapter 1. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. Give your servant success by granting him a favor in the presence of this man. He's talking about the meeting he's about to have with the king. Now, Nehemiah could do nothing to help Israel on his own. I mean, you know, one person can't rebuild the wall. He needed the God of Kairos. Prayer is what turns the chronological into the illogical. Pastor, I got it all, man. It just, you know, I, I don't know. You know, it's just going to, it makes a whole, can I tell you, God, I, I'm all for budgeting. I'm all for debt snowballs and stuff, but we serve a God of miracles too. Amen. Amen. And when you, when you don't just do the plan, but you invite God into the plan, your little chronological plan just might turn into an illogical plan. In other words, God might do, begin to do stuff that just blows your mind. Prayer means that any moment can be a God moment. People of, that live a Kairos life, now, now listen, we, we're going to skip right over this if I don't get it, so I'm going to move this so you get what I'm saying. <laughs> People who live a Kairos life instead of a Kronos life, you, say, you, you, might look at, you might look at myself or some other man of God, and you might say, well, how, do, how come they just seem like God just always, how come it just seems like they are Kairos while I'm Kronos? I mean, I'm just ticking off the clock, and they're doing great things for God. I, I, I'm going to give you the secret. And you ain't going to like the secret because you already know the secret. <laughs> you just got to do the secret. Yeah, right. People that live a Kairos life instead of a Kronos life have a prayer life. Amen. That's it. No, pastor, it's got to be something else. I mean, I mean it's got to be like a calling, right, or a gifting. No, 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 no. God wants to do kairos with everybody. But you've got to talk to him, amen? You've got to spend time in his presence. You have to invite him into your world. The second thing that Nehemiah did was he didn't just pray during his time, but he prepared for his time. You've got to prepare for your time. Nehemiah had to grow as a leader. He had to meet important people. He had to inspect the situation. He had to gather crazy amounts of material and support. He had to make plans. He had to get organized. In other words, Nehemiah was using his chronological time, his chronos, to, repair, to prepare for his kairos time, his kairos. It, 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 listen, when, when, when you use your chronological time, when you decide that the time that God has given me, I am going to use this time to prepare to do something for God. I got great news for you. That means that all of your chronos becomes kairos. 
Now, now, now let me prove it to you with an analogy. In, in sports, we know this, that a person will go to the Olympics and they will compete for like how long? You know, some of, some of them are like literally like it's just seconds, you know, that they're competing for. And, and, they, and they win maybe by a tenth of a second. Right? They're taking that moment, that atomic, that atom, that, that atomos, that moment, and, and they're using it for something that literally could split time. They could be remembered for the rest of their life for being the fastest person in that category or whatever. But they had prepared for like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. In other words, they dedicated all of their chronos so that one day they might experience one great big gold medal kairos. Amen? Now, now, now listen. Does that mean that the only big moment in their life was the time when they won the medal? No, no, no. It means those are all connected. It means that their chronos, because it was dedicated to their kairos, the whole thing became a God thing, if you will. Now, I'm spiritualizing it now. For them, it might, it's just a, it's, it's a medal. Now, listen, <laughs> Jeannie and I were watching uh, football the other day, much to her objection, and I... Uh, I told her, I said, honey, there's only 30 seconds left on the game, and then we'll watch the show that you want to watch. Just watch this 30 seconds with me. How many of you men have pulled this trick on your wife? I, I'm going to tell you women a, a man's secret. I'm going to lose a little piece of my man card for this, but I'm going to do it for you because I love the ladies of the church that much. I'm just going to give you this secret. They have actually done a study of NFL football games. And there is actually only about 22 minutes of actual playing time on the field. If you take away the clock that's running before they hike the ball, if you take away all the timeouts, all the commercials, everything else, you literally could watch that game in 22 minutes, and you could watch every single active moment on the entire game, right? <laughs> so the, the 30 seconds took 36 minutes. She timed it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Because there was a whole lot of chronos leading up to that little 36 seconds of Kairos, right? I mean, I mean, it was like, like it was like, like, oh, what's going on? You know, here's here's what you need to get. Listen, chronos will always outweigh Kairos. Not every moment's going to be this gigantic, you know, miracle moment. But get this: when chronos is used properly, it is actually a setup for divine moments. In other words, all of this can be Kairos. If you give it to God and you use it towards the big moments in your life. We have a whole bunch of college students that go to our church. And we have a, a, a college here called Kansas City School of Ministry. And I, I have the opportunity to go in and speak to them and hang out with them. And we do life with them. And, and, and right now, for the most part, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not really the Kairos time. It's preparation time, right? It, it's Kronos time at the moment. But how many of you know, if they will dedicate this Kronos, these four years, these five years, whatever it is, <laughs> for some of us, it'd be like seven years. But, but if they will dedicate this Kronos to God, how many of you know, God will do something divine. He will connect it all. Amen. He'll say, I've got a funnel, baby, and if you just keep on going, keep on going, at the drop, at the bottom of it, I am going to do something atomic. I'm going to take all of that Kronos, and I'm going to use it for Kairos. Finally, number three is they obeyed God, or Nehemiah obeyed God while he had time. You've got to obey God while you have time. While others just kept punching the clock of Kairos, or Kronos, if you will, Nehemiah actively sought after opportunities to do something for God. What made Nehemiah's chronos different than everybody else's? Well, it was really simple, really simple. This is also simple and so hard. <laughs> Nehemiah actually actively sought to obey God. I, I think what strikes me the most, and we're almost done here, is that Nehemiah was so intentional about wanting God to disrupt was, which, what was a pretty comfortable existence for him. Again, it's, it seems to me as I read the story that the king liked him. It seems like he was hanging out with royalty. He was, he, maybe this position could have led to a better position. I mean, Nehemiah was in a place of comfort that everybody else wasn't, and yet he was just simply obeying God and begging God to do something supernatural. How many of you in the nonstop, relentless, relentless clicking off of your chronological time, how many of you long for something of Kairos nature? Amen. I can promise you, God put that longing in your spirit, whether you live in a shack or a mansion. God has put something in you that says, I want something different. I want something supernatural. I want to be involved with the purposes of God. What separates the simply ambitious from those who experience the assistance of God is a hunger to obey God. And Nehemiah had this hunger. 
I think often we, we, we teach the grace of God so much that we forget that the grace of God is supposed to make us long to obey God. It, 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 in fact, I'll say it like this. I question whether or not you've really experienced the grace of God if you don't want to obey God deeper. Every time I experience God's love, I'm just like, God, I just want to submit to you further. I'm sorry for wasting all of this. And I just want to, I just want to give it to you. I just want to lay it at the altar and just say, that's, that's yours. It's not mine anymore. That's yours. I just thank you for your grace. I just want to obey you. One of the Psalms that just rocked my world in the last two months of last year, I just kept reading it over and over again. It's the longest book in the Bible, but you can get through it real easy. It's Psalm 119. And I, and, I, and I look at this psalm, and we have David just crying out to, to want to know God, to want to obey God. He says it like this. He says, Lord, teach me your decrees. Teach me them. With my, with my lips, I rec- recount all the laws that come from your mouth. Look at what he says. I rejoice in following your statues as one rejoices in great riches. Now, now, now let's just ask an honest question. If I said, you get to obey God this week, or you can have these great riches... Which one would you rejoice in better? <laughs> Probably we'd be like, I, well, I can obey God anytime. Give me the riches. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hey, David's saying it like this. No, no, no. Listen, I rejoice in God as if I just won the lottery. I rejoice in God as if I have great riches. Why? Because that's how badly I want to obey him. I meditate on his precepts and I consider his ways. David is literally sitting around his house going, I just want to meditate and think about ways I can obey God more. I just want to think about ways that I can obey the law more. I just want to think about ways that I can make God even happier. I delight in your creeds. The way that what makes me happy is to make you happy. Amen? And I will not neglect your word. Look at what he says. He says, be good to your servants while I live on this earth. Why? Why, why be good to me, God? Why give me good health? Why give me a good life? Why? So that I might have some more days to obey you. What if that got inside of you? Open my eyes, God, that I might see the wonderful ways of your laws. And again, and I talked about the grace of God and stop the madness and all this during, during um, um, communion time. And so you know how I feel about God's grace. But I think we have raised a bunch of Christians that are just like all we ever rejoice in. is so we're grace of God, and I don't have to obey God because he loves me. And I, and I didn't get it right, but he loves me. What if what made you happy was to love him back? To, what made you happy was he always gets it right. How about we get it right sometimes? Amen? He's always hungry to love you. Why aren't you hungry to obey him? And, 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 and you said, Pastor, I want to, be great. I want to know the secret of greatness. I, if, if, there's, if there's two secrets, it's, it's a prayer life and a hunger to, hunger to obey God. That's it. What separates people that are doing great things from God from people that just never seem to? They're always Kronos people, never Kairos people. It's, it's that hunger to obey God. I want you to get this. Nehemiah didn't have to do this. Everybody else was in danger. He was safe. But he's like, God, can you just mess this whole world up? Because I'm so tired of it. Even in a palace, this... It's just boring. I mean, yeah, I got on royal robes and I eat cool food and I hang out with kings. But it's still, it's just Kronos, man. How I many you know Kronos is just, it's still Kronos in a Mercedes. You know, a little, a little, little beat up Dodge pickup truck and a fancy Mercedes, it's still just Kronos. The only thing that makes life worth living is when God invades the space. Amen? So before I release you today, before we get started, let me just warn you about something. We aren't living in a world of Kairos. We're living in a world of Kronos. I'll prove it to you. I mean, this has been a sermon where you've learned some Greek words, and so you're smart now, and you just go into your boss tomorrow and just say, hey, I've learned a couple new Greek words and my pastor really motivated me and so I've decided I am no longer going to obey your chronos. 
can't be controlling my time, 40 hours, 50 hours. Want me to punch that clock and you can count my time? Forget you, man. I, I, I'm Kairos, baby. Make a T-shirt, everything. It'd be awesome. You can wear it in the unemployment line. Right? Because it's not going to work. Why? Because you don't live in a world of Kairos. You live in a world of Kronos. Now, I've got good news for you. God is the God of every second of every day. Amen? And that's all right. You can be faithful in a world of Kronos. But, but get this, get this, get this. Kronos people are always intimidated by Kairos people. Why? Well, because, man... They're just clicking off their clock. They, they're, just, they're just trying to be comfortable. They're just partying it up. Why is it? I, I remember this when I was in high school, and I'd be around guys that were smoking pot, and they always wanted me to smoke their pot. And, 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 I, and I'm trying to love Jesus, you know, and they want me to smoke their pot. And I always would say to them, I'd say, if I don't smoke it, you get, more, you get to smoke it more. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I smoke it, then you're going to have less, and it's just, you know, it's just math. And, 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 and <laughs> a lot of them weren't real good at math, uh, but, but, uh, but, but, but why does, why does sin love partnership? Why does it, what is it? Because I don't want to be over here smoking my chronos while you're living up your Kairos. You get what I'm saying? That's going to make me upset. It's going to make me feel bad. If I'm wasting my time, what will make that awesome is if you waste your time. You get it? And so expect it. Expect it, man. All these Kronos people, they're going to be intimidated by some Kairos people, right? That's what happened in Nehemiah's time. They were slaves. You know what slavery is? Slavery is when you let somebody else control your Kronos. That's what slavery is. That's it. Say, Pastor, I got to work another job because I got all that debt. Well, that's right. You know, another word for debt, slavery. You got the car, now that car company gets your chronos. Get it? You give away enough of your chronos, you'll hardly ever have any kairos. I know people that aren't here in church this morning because why? Because they got so much debt. That where they work controls all of their time. And there just ain't any time for God. In Nehemiah's time, they were used to the people of Israel being the ones that made their chronos more comfortable. You want your chronos to be comfortable? Get you some slaves. Right? I call them interns. Anyway, but... but uh, Got to get me some interns. I used to have some interns, but I don't have any. They're also good for blaming stuff on. Whenever something goes wrong, you're like, stupid intern. What is your anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. Come on, lighten up. See, slavery, slavery works because people don't think they have any other choice. It's, it's, a, a slavery is when, is when it gets into your identity and you start believing that I don't deserve anything good. I mean, everybody else, they get to experience the good Cairo stuff of God. But for me, I mean, my time is just, no, no. When Israel decided that they would no longer do it anymore, when Israel decided, you know what? A hundred years ago, we were set free from captivity. A hundred years ago, our God told us that we could be free. And we just haven't taken this from you yet. But we're going to take it today. Amen. And in fact, we're going to build some walls so we can defend it. And what happened? All the people around them got mad and upset. All the people around them said, you can't do that. You can't do that. We got you, man. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, sure. Legally, you're free. But I mean, come on. You're still our slaves. And they said, no, no, no. And look at what happened. I love this because this is what God wants to do for you. And this is the last verse, I promise. Sort of. All right, here we go. Nehemiah 6.16. It says, when all of the enemies heard about this, the surrounding nations, they were afraid. Why? Because it is scary to see somebody operate in Kairos. And they lost their self-confidence. Wow. Because they knew that this work had been done, not by ordinary human hands, but it had been done with the help of God. Amen. I want you to stand to your feet all throughout the church this morning. Now listen, God wants to bless you. Amen. Say it with me. God wants to bless me. My favorite part of this new chorus we sang this morning, it was that part where it said, it is God's will that you be healed. 
It is God's will for you to be blessed, man. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. He wants to honor you. But you just got to give your time to him. Lord, this time isn't my time. This is God's time. You got to say, God, I want to invite you right into this. I, I, we, we deal with a lot of uh, folks that are, are, are in poverty at our church. And, and we, have a, we have a big ministry that you should serve in called the Marketplace. And, and one, one thing that poverty does is it turns chronos into this boring mundane existence right because we can't, we don't have any money to do anything we don't have any time to do anything we don't have well, listen the people of israel they had no resources either don't you think they would have fixed it if they could they lived among these broken down walls for almost 100 years and what happened when one man of god one man of god one man of god named nehemiah finally said god i'm inviting you into this situation it's bigger than me I don't want for my clock to just click off and me never do anything for you. I'm going to leave the palace. I'm going to serve you. And before you knew it, before you knew it, the resources of the king of the largest nation in the world at that time were on their behalf. They literally were cutting down trees from the forest of a foreign king to rebuild the walls with the permission of the king. How many think our God knows how to do it? Amen? Amen. Our God knows how to do it. You got to invite him into your situation. Invite him into your situation. But you got to lift your eyes unto the hills from where your help comes from. Amen. Listen, anybody can talk about what they're going through as if God's not involved. Even people that have no faith curse God. People of faith, what separates people of faith from everybody else is how they talk about the season they're facing, the situation they're facing. It might be bad, but man, bad times mean big opportunities. Amen. It might be really tough, but that means God can come rescue me. And I, might, I, I might be sick, but that means I can be healed. I might be poor, but that means I can be blessed. Amen? I, I'm not trying to be, you know, weird on you this morning. I'm just telling you, God wants to invade your situation. He wants to turn all of this into something he could use for his glory. I don't know how much time I have left. I tried to kill myself when I was a teenager, and put a gun to my head, I pulled the trigger, it didn't go off. I believe that all of my chronos, all of it, all of it, I put it all on the line that day and I said, I'm going to waste it. And God said, no, no, I'm going to save it. And so quite literally, it's not mine. Amen. Now, you may have never done that. I don't suggest it. But quite literally, it's not mine yours. Amen? It's his. I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you. I lay it at your feet because I want you to invade my chronos and make it kairos. Make it something awesome. So, Father, I pray over your people right now. In Jesus' name, I just thank you for the power of your word. And I pray right now, God, that this series... I, as I listened to Jordan's message last week, I just sat in my car and I wept and I just said, God, I want you to use me. I, I, I think you've just done that every week of this series. You're trying to tell your people that this time you live in, it's not an ordinary time. Not everybody goes to this church. Not everybody got to hear these messages. You're... You're a special people. I think the Spirit of God would say this this morning. You're a, you're a special people. You're an anointed people. I have a purpose for you. Stop judging my power by your circumstances. I'm above your circumstances. Invite me in. Invite me in. The Spirit of God would say, invite me in. And I'll change everything. Come on, just ask them right now. They're under your breath. We've already prayed a salvation prayer this morning. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. Let's just, let's just pray this under our breath. Come on, just invite them in. Jesus, I invite you into my situation. The only reason why you're bored is because you haven't let the Spirit of God come into your situation. Many of us, God, we live among rubble, just like the children of Israel did. Our walls are broken down. The problems are big. 
52 days in this story and the walls were rebuilt. What could you do, God, if we submitted 52 days to you? What could you do, God, if we just give it all to you? All of our chronos could become kairos if we invite the God of kairos into our chronos. Help us, Lord, to do it. Help us to do it. Help us to do it. Pray for your people, God, that you have divine opportunity this week. God, I pray that the emotion of this moment, when it's gone, it will be replaced with a spiritual resolve. We'll start to spend time in your presence. We'll we'll hunger to obey you. More than even riches, God, we'll hunger to obey you. Do it in the hearts of your people, God. Do it in the hearts of your people. We pray that. What a powerful word this morning. But now, it's time to get started. We walk out these doors. The question is, what are you going to do with the time that you've been given? We all have a limited amount of time. What are we going to do with it? Such a powerful series. As you leave today, if you're planning to come to the missions banquet next Sunday after church, you need to make sure and sign up, get a a ticket today because we'll be ordering the food this week. We want to get a head count of how many people are coming. It's right outside these doors. Also, one of the things Pastor talked about was investing your time. We have small group tables set up outside that are getting ready to start on Wednesday night. Throughout this start series, maybe you felt like there's a habit that you should start or something that you should do with the time that God has given you. One of the best things you can do when you're trying to start a new goal or start a new habit is to get like-minded people around you that are going to encourage you to continue to do the things you've made a commitment to do. So stop by. We're going to have small group leaders out there. You can talk to them about their particular group. But I hope you guys have a great day. Take some time this week to say, God, what do you want me to do with my time? Have a great day.